It was my last day in Antwerp, and I got a call in the morning from Cheru, the nonprofit organization I spoke to the day before. They helped me to set up an interview with a woman who recently escaped prostitution. So that's where I started my day. This is Claudia. She agreed to speak with me if I changed her name and hid her identity. I'm from Bulgaria. I am a gypsy Bulgarian. So what was childhood like for you? It was kind of living like very poor. Mm. Like no clothes, no shoes, or if you have a shoes, it's from someone. My father was very uh, aggressive to us, especially when he drink, and he drink all the time. So, and I, I might be skipping a lot, I'm not sure, but so you worked as a sex worker for some time? I remember I ran away from home, and I remember before that I did hear it about prostitution, but I, I really didn't know what that mean. And when I ran away, I remember was uh, behind me was a car with a man, and he said, like, do you want to have a coffee with me? And I said, no, only if you're not PIM, if you're PIM. And he said, yes, I am a PIM. I said, okay, I will come to have coffee with you. Everything what I was doing that time, I really didn't know what that mean. Really not. I didn't even know what mean PIM. And he bring me to other PIM. And that was the real PIM. And that real PIM, he sent me to Holland. So you had, so this guy was kind of, uh, you'd go and do prostitution work and, yes. and he was like looking over you and did you have to pay him? Or? Normally, yes, you do have to pay to a lot of, of the pimps, especially like this one. But I don't know how and what really happened, but I didn't pay anything. When I went to Holland, I couldn't work. The only, I think I was very traumatized and I was only crying, like closing the windows and crying and trying to not be with men. And he had other girls there, like a three girls, and they needed to pay my window because I don't make money. How long were you uh, working in prostitution? I think if I put all together, maybe three years. So it seems like you, you didn't really enjoy doing it. No. But why did you keep going back to it? What I knew, I didn't knew nothing before. Before I knew only the, the farm. I, I knew that is the normal life, the farm. Because then she was also going to the window. She was working here in the window. And I think I was only 18. I was very traumatized. And for me, it was more like I will be everywhere where people put me. I was not in my mind. I was not in me. I didn't know the right and not right. It's good and not good. I really didn't know that. Leads into what I was going to ask you. Um, you know, what, what do you think you would have needed to make it so you never had to have done sex work? Education, work. Maybe that's what I need that time. That time I needed that. And also the, the scary thing is like when, with who you are. Like I was with my cousin and she was in the same business. And she couldn't give me the advices or something to do something else. For her somehow that was the normal. And I don't know how, but that came normal for me too. So do you, I mean, I'm sure you talk to a lot of the women. Have you ever met someone that actually wants to do that type of work and is there because they want to be? Or would you say that most of the women are in the same situation as you where it's the only option? Yes, I think it's only option. I don't really think there is someone because she like it and she want to do it. I don't think so. If someone like to do it, maybe she will not going to do it for money. I don't know. but. I know women and when you hear the stories, always someone is here because of something happened in your country. Or you have a big problems or your family or your children or your husband sell you or your parents sell you. Always there is something. Speaking with Claudia made me think back on the interviews I'd already done. The pimp in Amsterdam, who told me most women working the windows come from outside of Europe. And Fritz, the outreach worker that told me there were no women that actually choose to do this work. They do it because they have no other options. And Claudia confirmed both of those things. With the help of Shea Root, she says she was able to start a new life away from the red light district. He Root helped me a lot. He Root and also the patients, because coming out of the street, you make a lot of mistakes. And when you stop the work, doesn't mean everything is finished. 
Now, many of the things now is starting, the trauma, the oh, so much. And they have it, all this patience with me, all this love, taking care of me and the kids. It's amazing, really. If you were to go to the red light district in Amsterdam or Antwerp, you would see people laughing and having a good time. We were in here, I had an experience, and now we've been uh, go drinking with our friends, and we came here. Have you guys ever, like, fuck some mukas, do some cocaine? Yeah. Have you... But after speaking with Claudia and many other women, I found out behind the windows it's much different. There's sadness, poverty, and an overall ambition to escape the past. Now, there were two more things I wanted to do before I left Antwerp. I still needed to check back in with Rebecca to find out how she managed to escape sex trafficking. But before I did that, I had to head back to the red light district. Hey, how's it going? Hey, how are hi. you? Thank you. Hello. Oh, hi. <laughs> April Schieflers is a lobbyist for EU humanitarian issues. Some would say she takes her work home with her. So right down there is the red light district. One of the reasons she chose this apartment was so she could learn more about the women working in the windows. If you, you definitely have the pimps and um, usually driving their cars by too, but you also have some men who usually have bikes or other things and they're usually like undocumented migrants or people who don't have the ability to work here, who their job is just to go pick up things for the women. I had to ask her who she sees visiting the windows most often really, you know, old grandpas here, really young men, um, men on their fancy uh, race bikes, you know, who are cycling through and doing whatever. She's worked in both the U.S. and the EU as a lobbyist, and I was curious if she thought it was better to make prostitution illegal, like it is in the U.S., or to legalize it, like it is in much of Europe. In the U.S. where it's illegal, you have the situation where women are criminalized for doing this work. If you have this on your record, how likely are you going to be to get any other job? Not likely at all. She says this forces women to continue to do sex work for money, as the criminal background limits their options. And as we heard earlier from Claudia, many women don't have the education or skills to even find or obtain another job. And in European countries where it's legal? Um, where you still have pimps profiting, um, you still have really precarious economic situations because these women are usually self-employed. So there's no job security uh, when it comes to uh, sexual health, emotional health, all of these things. Um, there's very little um, security net. And I know from talking to women like Claudia that this work can take a very heavy toll on them emotionally. Because coming out of the street, you make a lot of mistakes. And when you stop the work, it doesn't mean everything is finished. No, many of the things now is starting, the trauma. Claudia did eventually get the help she needed, but not from a government agency or organization, from a privately funded nonprofit. Schiefler says Claudia's story is a perfect example of the lack of resources in the EU, but she says the U.S. is no better. So I would say that the current sort of policy solutions that we think about it, that we frame it with, are really inadequate because what they're really doing is putting a Band-Aid on like a bullet wound. While I was speaking with Schieflers, all I could think about was Rebecca and her story about being trafficked from Africa to Madrid. I wanted to know how she escaped and if the government helped her at all. The last time we spoke with her, she realized she had been sex trafficked and would be required to pay her traffickers for the rest of her life. And the remaining balance that I still have to pay that means I have to work like all my life to pay that money. At this point in her story, she'd been forced to do sex work for four years and decided it was time to escape. But she says that was no easy task. Each time I moved, they know where I'm going. So, so you tried to stop doing sex work and they would, what would they do? They follow you and, and knock on your door? They call. Most of the time it's calling. Most of the time is they go to my parents. She says they weren't just stopping by her parents' home to have a talk. They were there to make a point. And to do that, they would destroy their home and assault them. And with no passport, Rebecca was still living in Madrid. And every time she would step outside, she would get a call from an unknown number. You haven't paid. If, if you think you, you're going to run away, 
I'm seeing you, I know where you live, blah, blah, blah. She eventually made her way from Madrid to Belgium, and that's when she found Sherut. I don't know how to say it, but Sherut is the number one of everything. They took care of me and my baby, uh, they gave me house, they food, clothing, everything was on Sherut's. I wasn't paying house rent, nothing. They helped me. While Rebecca is doing better, there are some things Root just cannot help with. She's still stuck dealing with her traffickers and they still want their money. Last year, they took my sister, my junior sister. Yes, they cannot be small beating they beat me. She said they beat me. Even says they give me drink I drink yesterday. The drug her. This money now called the regain myself. She received those messages a year ago. That was the last time she heard from her sister. This is all taking a very heavy toll on Rebecca emotionally. She was smuggled away from her home, forced to sleep with random men, had a great deal of pressure put on her by her parents to send home money, and just when she thought she got away from it all, they pulled her back in. Of the truth, last year, I, um, I, I almost killed myself and my baby. Nah, come on, you made it so far. Or... Really, two times I, I committed, I almost committed suicide twice with the baby, so. And thinking of uh, living here in Belgium, uh, not having papers and all, I still don't know. Rebecca is trying to work with police in Brussels to find her sister, but she has no idea where she is and doesn't know what the traffickers even look like. Because of that, the police told her they couldn't help. I was hoping this story would have a happy ending. I assumed that because Rebecca was sitting right in front of me that she had to have gotten away from her traffickers. But this isn't a movie. This is real life. And in real life, there's some bad people. And Rebecca was stuck dealing with the worst of them. I went to Europe to find out how human trafficking was affecting women around the world. I spoke to a woman who had been trafficked from Africa and another who was convinced to start doing sex work by a pimp. One of my main takeaways was that even in a country where prostitution was legal, I couldn't find a woman who was doing the work because they actually enjoyed it. And even though it was time for me to go home, that didn't mean my work was done. It was time for me to take a closer look at human trafficking in my own backyard. Hey everybody, I just want to say thank you for watching this whole documentary series. I know this is a very depressing topic and, you know, watching through every episode, you kind of get to the end thinking probably, well, I wish I could do something about this. And I don't want to leave anybody feeling like they can't do things to help. Now, I went to Europe to, you know, cover this, but you don't really need to go overseas to cover something like this. I live here in Madison, Wisconsin. And I know for a fact that sex trafficking is happening here in Madison, Wisconsin. And no matter if you're in the United States in a small town, a big city, or if you're overseas somewhere in a different country, it's probably happening around you. And I think uh, a way to address that, a way to teach you how you can help to stop this, is to talk about some of the things that lead to sex trafficking. Now, the main thing is poverty. Uh, drug use is a big thing. Uh, child abuse, domestic violence, these are all things that kind of lead to sex trafficking and they all play a little role in there. So, you know, I know in my community I have organizations that help with all of those things and you probably do in your community as well. So a way you could help is just to get involved with those organizations and over time you might learn a little bit more about what's actually happening in your community and how you can work to combat those things. Now, if this is a subject matter that's a little too heavy for you, you can always just donate a few bucks or maybe you can donate clothes or there might be some way that you can just get involved and help out. And, you know, possibly sex trafficking is not actually happening in your community, but I guarantee some of the things that lead to it are. Maybe there's people that are struggling with drug use or people that are struggling with domestic violence. So if you, if you just get involved with those things, and helps to kind of stop that or help people get away from that, that's ultimately helping people stay away from sex trafficking and not become victims. But uh, I have to say I do appreciate everybody watching this. 
I spent my own money and my own time to go do this. It's something that I'm passionate about. And I plan to keep doing this kind of stuff here in the States and, you know, maybe take a few more trips overseas. So if there's somewhere you guys think I should go, feel free to comment or send me an email or send me a message and say, you know, I think you should go check this place out and I'll add it to my list. Thanks for watching.